Coming to you from Orange County, California, this is the Jug Life Podcast with Max Ada and Chad Wesley Smith. Hey everybody, Chad Wesley Smith here, bringing you another episode of the Jug Life Podcast. I am uh, joined, as always, but... Uh, at a bit of a distance, we've got a big technical budget going on today to be joined all the way from Oakland, California, the Montana Miracle Man, Marvelous Max Ada. How you doing, buddy? Doing pretty well. How are you guys doing? They're good, I think. They'll tell, tell us in the comments if you're good. Um, <laughs> so today we're going to be talking to you about USAW Nationals. But before we do that, quick thank you to our sponsors, Grind Sports Nutrition, Virus International, Trifecta Nutrition, and Quaaludes and Quest Bars, it's a lifestyle. So we just got back last or a few days ago from USAW Nationals held just outside of Chicago, Illinois, and it was a pretty successful weekend for the team. Uh, I think it was a pretty successful weekend for USA weightlifting. And we're gonna want to talk to you about some of the highs, maybe a couple of the lows. And just give you a look at the at the weekend from our perspective. All right, so thanks for bearing with us on our on our unique uh, camera setup today. But you know, Max is taking some time up in NorCal after the meet, so this is the kind of the best we could do for you guys. There's there's probably five main points that we want to talk about in regards to uh, this past nationals competition, and some positive, some negative, and let's lead it off with a uh, with the positive. So, Coach Max, how did you yes. feel about the Team Juggernaut performance? Uh, overall, I was pretty happy. Uh, you know, we had quite a few really good performances, uh, you know, starting with Michael Fox, a national champion. This is the second time him being national champion, so that was really cool. Uh, he took a crack at an American record clean and jerk. Uh, missed the jerk, but but, you know. It's always good when people are, are attempting those numbers because it means that we're getting close. You know, Alyssa, Alyssa did great because she came out of a little bit of a, an injury with her elbow. We didn't really say much about it and uh, had the best meet of her life. Really fought super hard for it. Yeah, definitely didn't say much about it because even I did not really know that that was going on with her elbow. Yeah, well, you know, we didn't want to, like, say it and then have everybody. I mean, that was, that was probably the tightest battle I've seen because – Alyssa's, category, Alyssa's class, the 48s, was stacked. You had Kathleen Winters and Megan Siegert, and both of those girls snatched in the high 70s. Alyssa edged everybody out by a kilo. Yeah, it was uh, 76, 77, 78. Yeah, and so that was a that was super tight battle in that class. And then the clean and jerks were, were also pretty solid. I mean, everybody was taking shots at... at good weights i mean it was not a, it was a it was a really tight class you know there's always the do you tell you know the injury thing like if your competitors know you're injured does that really change anything because they're still going to try and train hard and lift big weights but i think it does help to be you know you don't want to just expose everything and then have them that much more confident that they're gonna you know beat you so you know we didn't and and she came out and she's just a she's a gamer you know she's a super awesome performer and that was awesome so uh, you know, started off really well. It was a really cool, like, like big uh, boost for all of us to come out of the gates strong like that. Definitely, yeah. Set, set the tone for the whole, for the whole weekend. You know, particularly yeah. on the on the men's side with our last team experience being yeah. <laughs> American Open, where we let off and and Mike Fox uh, bombed out in the snatch. It was like, at least from the team perspective, the meet was done before it had even started. Yeah, uh, yeah, was, exactly. So that was. Yeah, that was cool. That was really good to have that that uh, momentum going into it. It was just a positive experience for everyone. Um, yeah, I think also, too, it lends itself to showing that, like, you know, people maybe get too into their head about, like, I'm this kind of person or I'm that kind of person. You know, oh, I always do bad or I always do well. Like, it can change at any meet, and it can be a good meet or a bad meet. You know, it's it's all depends on how you approach it and how your training was and all that. So, so it was a good start. You know, uh, Courtney battled it out with uh hogan um you know she struggled to to make the the list she needed to kind of catch her those two are really like they're going to battle out 
back and forth until someone else comes out of there, until another 58 can catch. You know, no one's going to catch Courtney in the snatch, and no one's going to catch Caitlin in the clean and jerk right now um, because they're both really far ahead of everybody. So it was basically those two battling back and forth, and, you know, Courtney won it in Reno, and then Caitlin came back and bettered her total here and and won in uh, um, Chicago. So, you know, that was... That's going to be one of those things that's always going back and forth with them. Kristen did. Kristen's class was way more competitive than I had expected or had anticipated. The the sixty threes had a girl snatching ninety one from the B session yeah. and jerking like one oh seven. And you, you know, from from a coaching perspective, it was a mistake to have her in the B session because she could have probably maybe even won the thing if she had a chance to take the weight she needed to win it, but she had zero chance of ever taking the, the winning lift from the B session, unless she was just ahead of everybody. But still like that was like, maybe her second meet super, super competitive. There were, you know, Kristen did, uh, 89 and one Oh four, which was a really good meet for her. Um, and she was eighth place. And the winning snatch was 92. So three kilos separated, you know, first from tying. I think Kristen tied for third and fourth. So ended up like fifth in the snatch maybe. Yeah. Um, three kilos is really, really tight competition. Yeah, particularly comparing it to the American Open where yeah. Kristen got third in the snatch at 86. Yeah. And fourth in the total at... 189 yeah to come to come back for from 189 to be fourth in the total and at american open just six months ago and now for her to make 193 and that be yeah. eighth i mean obviously yeah. more more people showed up we're still missing our two best 63s yeah. and yeah. mary mary peck and maddie myers um but incredibly deep class tons yeah. of athletes uh, and a comment that had been made, made, uh, by you, by, uh, you know, we had Ed Cohen visiting us there is how much different the oh, athletes yeah. look from a physique standpoint and, yeah. you know, Pope, a prime example of this, that they're just much more muscular, much more athletic looking and, and yeah. that class, maybe, maybe more so than any of the others. Yeah. And it's not to say that like before we had like less athletic people. I think there's a combination of things. I think one factor is you're getting more talented athletes coming out of the woodwork. So you're going to have more of the, you know, quote unquote, genetic freaks, you know, the people that are just more muscular, more, more built for lifting. And you have a lot better training. You know, you have way more coaches that are a lot more knowledgeable. Uh, So, you know, you're getting people that come out of it that are, that are just producing, um, so that was actually that that class was there was a lot of fun. It was it was a challenge for me in the back because it was myself and Joanne and then uh, you know Jacob Highs and JP were helping because it was actually three people going simultaneously, um, and that that would actually be one big criticism I have of USAW is putting a sessions at the same time in multiple platform meets. Let's let's save that for for a little oh. bit uh, later. But continuing on with the team before we move on yeah. to to the next people, you know, Kristen Pope again can't say this enough. I made a big post about it at the Arnold, you know, where she had all the issues with the flight getting out there for the Arnold and still came in even though she was there 24 hours later than planned, only you know a few like a half a day before the meet. Yeah, it. the same thing here. She had some some rough training going into the meet. Um, she had done a clean. She had in the last two weeks when Zygmunt was out here, you know, I left. When I left, she had done 105 on a Friday. And the next time she cl- successfully made over 90 kilos was in the warm-up room <laughs> at meet. Yeah, so she had this this rough training going yeah. in. And, and then at the meet – maybe the roughest <laughs> the roughest part of it is her first her f- literally first <laughs> yeah. warm up the first thing she did after introductions was oh, yeah. start muscle snatch with the empty bar and just wax herself in the face with right in the nose. 
Yeah, right in the nose with the bar. And yeah, I'm, I walk in the back and I see her and I was like, holy shit, why is Kristen, why is Kristen crying? Like, why, why, why does it look like her eyes are all teared up? I was like, we haven't done anything yet. Yeah. Like, there's no, nothing that's going on. So she whacks herself in the, in the nose. Surprisingly, it doesn't break her nose. Like, get, gave herself a bloody nose with that. And then to still go out and, and lift really well. Uh, yeah. I think she's she's shown herself to be a very a very tough competitor, a much tougher competitor than than I think anyone out there in in social yeah. media world uh, gives her credit for. Um, oh yeah, yeah. You know, she, I in my own fault, I totally screwed up her opening clean and jerk. I didn't get the change in on time, and she had had to run out. And grabbed the bar and start pulling, and she started the lift at one second on the clock and was successful. And you know, I mean, maybe that's what what worked was she just had to do it without yeah. thinking. But the fact that she had to run out there and grab a weight she hadn't made in the gym in a couple weeks and was very heady about and was was struggling to to conceptualize and put together, ran out and did it and made it, and it was really good. Um, is just, I mean, speaks volumes to her resilience. Uh, it was really, really a, just a, a tough competitor. Um, so, you know, that was the overall, I mean, she really killed it there. Yeah. And if, if you guys want to see, you know, Kristen does a great job with her own YouTube channel. So you can find her at uh, K R I S, the number one, the number 10, one zero Pope, Chris 10 Pope. Uh, she's got a couple part kind of recap of her experience at national so make sure you guys go check that out yeah and then uh you know pomp uh anthony and paul uh anthony and uh sam ernst competed in the uh same session same time uh sam ernst didn't do so hot he bombed uh in the snatch um you know, and, and a big part of that is probably just just us setting more realistic numbers and, and establishing a better protocol for for what to open with, what to take. Uh, you know, and and bomb outs are always you, you got to be careful with bomb outs. If if you miss lifts, you know, it's if you miss a lift here and there, you have you have a pretty definitive reason as to why a bomb out can be a couple different. You know, it could be mental, it could be mistakes. You know, you could press lifts, lifts out and bomb. I mean. Um, you got to be careful not to just throw everything out the window and turn around and say, Oh, it's a, it's the training or this, that I got to do everything different. But at the same time, you have to evaluate like what, what really is causing you to, to fail those lifts. Cause he also bombed at uh, American open. So not, not the best track record for Sam. He's young. And, you know, I think probably to be fair, I let his, a youthful exuberance to take big weights, get the best of me and think that he was a little more prepared than he was for those numbers. And I think he's, you know, with, with online coaching and stuff being so prevalent now, a bit of a cautionary tale in, in terms of online coaching that we live in Southern California, Sam lives, Sam lives in Virginia. And, yeah. you know, it's, if if you're training in that situation, which can be great and can be extremely effective, Alyssa Ritchie's making international, teams and, and winning national championship through true pure remote coaching but the communication has to be great and if yeah. it's not being communicated to the coach that hey you know i really weigh i weigh 89 <laughs> but i can yeah. as an 85 that's a big a big thing to factor in and, and sam and i talked about that for a while uh the next day while watching one of the other sessions yeah. Uh, yeah. i don't i don't want to glaze, yeah. glaze over you know we, we're past him in the in the body weights, but don't want to glaze over Jacob highs. Who's no, no. who's one of pomps guys, longtime guy, cross, very good CrossFit competitor, making more focus on weightlifting, you know, phenomenal One thirty kilo snatch in the 77s, uh, ended up actually tying for third place. And then because there's no body weight rule now and a unique interpretation, I guess, of, of have to do it first, which I interpret three in the afternoon to be before, 8 p.m., but I guess first attempts take precedent over second yeah. attempts. Ended up losing out on what would have been his first uh, first national medal in the snatch, so I ended with fourth in the snatch. But he he did a great a great job. He's just a really athletic guy, yeah, super great solid team kid. guy. Yeah, Pomp's, Pomp's done a great job with Jacob. Jacob is just a Jacob's a pleasure to work with too because he's just so down he's just so down to earth and just he's just like Pomp. 
it's really yeah. funny because the two of them are just like they're so just relaxed and and composed and just they're just having a big smile on their face and having a good time so yeah that was that was really good for him um yeah and then uh yeah i forgot uh courtney chan in the 53s going with courtney bachelor uh, you know, a similar scenario to, to Sam Ernst. She didn't do so hot. She bombed uh, there. Um, and again, you know, we, we talked with her about some of the factors that, that we need to work on. Uh, you know, body weight, cutting, this kind of thing is, is a big deal. Um, and then also, you know, us picking picking reasonable attempts, obviously picking the right attempts. Um, you know, so so not to, to leave her out there. Uh, and then... You know, simultaneously, Kristen's lifting, Sam Ernst is lifting, uh, and then uh, Pomp was also in that session. So Pomp, Pomp, you know, I was really like to give Pomp a huge credit and, and Charlotte too, uh, because Pomp came out here. He came out to the meet, uh, had a baby, you know, ten days before, yeah. fifteen days, before, right? Yeah, uh, that's yeah, so congratulations to Pomp and, and his yeah. girlfriend Charlotte on on Rocco. Rocco. Rocco Rocco Leonardo. Yeah. I think. Uh, Rocco... He probably has abs. He was born with abs for sure. <laughs> and a mustache. If your name is Rocco Leonardo Pomponio. Yeah. <laughs> it's a sort of Italian name. He'll never that kid will never have a shirt with sleeves his whole life. <laughs> That's true. Uh <laughs> But, you know, he, he came out, really Pomp was just there to help support the team and, and kind of, you know, put put a meat under his belt and all those. And, and he did, you know, didn't have like any kind of, you know, monster day. Still hit 140, 174, which is better than he had been doing in training. So, you know, if you look at it from the perspective of a, a, a heavy training day, it was a really good step in the right direction for him. Yeah, um, I, it just I think for... to be nationals on the stage. Um, for you Pomp, know, so, so for Pomp too. Really was... good, you know, and, and to... You know, it's important to manage expectations and manage what we're what we're doing because there's no there's no way we could go into that thinking oh you're going to do one one fifty five one eighty five yeah. you know, and that's not that's not the point the point was to go score points be part of it stay involved in it and then get back to your life uh, you know and take care of the baby and Charlotte and and, and move on from there yeah so it was it was about know, nine nine weeks before the meet well so eleven weeks before the meet. Pomp yeah. got a cortisone shot in his knee. He had talked to an orthopedic surgeon, you know, maybe surgery was going to be necessary. So had this stuff going on. So he gets the cortisone shot and we, we you know, has a couple of weeks of this, just seeing how his body responds to it. And then I remember we all sat down, you, me, Pomp, Dr. Quinn, Dr. Joe sat down. All right. What is our plan for nine weeks? What do we consider success? And I, yeah. I remember us saying in, in that meeting, you know, if you go to nationals and do forty five seventy five, like that is a huge win. Yeah, and, yeah. And it was right there. I mean, yeah, he did forty on it was opening snatch, and then then missed forty five in yeah. front of him twice. But it's it was there. You know, seventy four seventy five. Those are the same. That yeah. it, he made good progress. He made the 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 forward positive momentum that we needed for him to build on. Because Pomp is, you know, he's he's national champion. He's multiple yeah. time American Open champion. He's very very capable to lift yeah. the weights that uh, that could be putting him on on a world team uh, in you know this year next year. Just a, a talented guy. So yeah, I mean, yeah, very very good for him. And the goal, you know, with Pomp, as with everybody, is to make progress and be steady here and and bring him into shape. Uh, you know when when time allows when that opportunity is is there um so you know awesome awesome for those guys next up we had uh nicole nicole who lifted in the 69s had a really good meet went four for six pr snatch in competition pr clean and jerk in competition the only prs that really count uh and and just a, a solid solid overall day nicole's a good competitor just she's been in sports her whole life and just knows how to behave, knows how to handle herself, and, and just did a good job. Um, so, yeah, I really wouldn't say anything she did or didn't do. Unfortunately, I think on her third clean and jerk, she stood up from it and started pla- blacking out. Yeah. And you could see her, you know, she's standing there, and she's kind of shaking, then her knees buckled, and that was, you know, 
that's the end of that. So it's kind of a bummer, but I'm pretty sure she would have made the jerk. Uh, she's been a really good jerker and, and traditionally. Um, so, you know, that's, that's good progress for her, but you know, was she, she needs to gain some weight and fill out the class and then move on and just keep, keep plugging uh, away as, as she has been. Thank you to Virus International, sponsor of the Jug Life podcast. Visit virusintl.com and use Jug, J-U-G-G, for 10% off your next order. Well, and something that's, you know, probably a good teachable moment from Nicole's performance and something that people watching the live stream were not aware of, um, interested to get your perspective on this, mm-hmm. is is what to do when you miss a lift in the back, how to react when you miss a lift in the back. So Nicole took 74 as her last warm up. Yeah. Opened at 77, makes it. And then because in these in the she was in the B session, 69 B session, in the B sessions at this at this meet, everyone's lifting the same weights. You know, everyone is in with their their yeah. entry total is the qualifying total. So she had like 12, she, you know, she was 12, 14 yeah. lifts or something in was going to be between her opener and second attempt. So we go back in the back to to stay warm and to take some lifts. And she proceeded to miss 75 kilos, two kilos than, less than she had just lifted on the platform three times in a row. So yeah. she missed 75. 90 seconds later, two minutes later, you know, she's a crossfitter. She could be doing every 10 seconds if she needed. Miss 75. Yeah. Miss 75. Yeah. Go, out on, go out on the platform, <laughs> miss 80, and then come back and, and make 80. What What advice do you have? to lifters, to coaches, when when things are not going the way they so, should in the, in the back room? One one thing that we, we have to look at that, there there's really like, it's like you have to play triage, right, with, with what's going on. So, you know, one thing is to always be aware of what the situation is going to be like at nationals. There's going to be, in any of these sessions, unless you're at the very top, there's going to be a lot of lifts that are the same you might have 15 attempts between your opening snatch and your second attempt. And that may be two kilos or three kilos different. So you have to be physically in shape enough to tolerate doing more lifts in the back, you know, physical things all aside, the mental side of going to the back and missing a lift, missing your last warm up, missing your, you know, your attempts at waving up and down um, in which Nicole did. Uh, you know, uh, Alyssa missed some lifts in the back too. The biggest thing I think from a coaching standpoint is you have to be, you have to anticipate the lifter or do you have nervous lifters? Do you have confident lifters? Do you have overconfident lifters? So, you know, Nicole is, is certainly not overconfident. She's very realistic about her abilities. Um, and, and, you know, seeing what she did, you know, if, if the lifter is going to miss a lift, you got to decide right off the bat and, and have a plan, you know, how are you going to approach them? Are you going to, are you going to fire them up and tell them, hey, come back and make it right now, and they're going to come back and do it? Are you going to say it's not a big deal, don't worry about it, it'll be different on the platform? Um, you know, every coach and every athlete have to pick what their strategy is, what to do. The one thing to not do is freak out as a coach. You can't, you can't stress the athlete out by saying, oh, my God, what's happening? You know, you're missing, like – and, and the other thing, too, is, like, one thing I see a lot of at some of these meets, and not not really from the more experienced coaches, but generally less experienced coaches, it's like they're teaching people how to lift in the warm-up room. <laughs> I mean, once you get there, coaching cues here and there, a few of them speckled into the warm-ups is all you need. I mean, if you're telling somebody, hey, you got to, you know, you got to push your knees back and get over the bar more and do this and do that and, like, you know, try this and, like, make sure it – it's already too late. I mean, you can't change anything. You know, you really can't change much without training anyways, but you're not going to come in the warm ups and, and fix someone's technique. The best you can do is reinforce their confidence and reinforce a, a few subtle keys, you know, uh, hone in on the one thing that you need to do to, to make the lift that if you didn't say it, they wouldn't do it. Uh, and then, you know, let, let them go. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I think in regards to, to the, you know, to, to handling your own emotions as the coach to help the, the athlete handle, handle theirs. You know, I'm in, I'm in the back with, a, with you guys for a lot of this stuff, and I'm just there to be there, you know, to, yeah. take, to take videos and to cheer people on and put a weight on here, here or there. But, so I, but I find myself having to be uh, particularly mindful of, of that, yeah. seeing someone miss, you know, just kind of 
biting my tongue and just being like, all right, you know, it's all right, it's, you're good. And it's it's like I've, I've seen this with with babies. You have a baby and they they they're trying to walk and they fall down and yeah. and, and they don't know if it hurt or not. So they turn yeah. around and they look at their parents. And if yeah, their parents, what, what their reaction <laughs> yeah. be. if the parents kind of laugh and like, ah, ha, 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 then the baby just gets up and they're fine. If the parents, exactly. oh, oh my God, are you okay? Then they're like, shit, something, something's wrong. And they react to that. So that, that's such an important part of, of coaching. And, you know, we can talk about program design and all, and all that stuff. And that's very important. And that's the science of coaching. And, you know, and then the art of coaching or the soft science, I guess the psychology of it is going to play such a big role when it is that the back room, when it is the in competition stuff and knowing your athletes and understand that, that coaching uh, successful coaching is a relationship between athlete and coach that, yes. that, you know, we have, we took 14 lifters with us to, to nationals and, and really have 14 pretty unique personalities in that <laughs> who are, who are all going to yeah. respond differently to different reactions in the back because we've seen Colin miss lifts in the back. We've seen Alyssa miss lifts, yep. Courtney's miss lifts, Nicole's miss lifts. They've all, they've all miss lifts in the back and, and you know, your reaction, Joanne's reaction, how that shapes the athlete's reaction yeah. goes a long way to if those misses in the back turn into misses where it counts. Yeah. You know, and that, that's something you, as a coach, the longer you do it, the more you get, you get comfortable with your personality, who you are. And and that's why there's different coaches, different athletes. I mean, I'm not the kind of guy who's going to turn around and yell at you and, you know, and berate somebody for missing and, 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 you know, somebody may do really well with that. If you threaten them right after they miss, you know, then they might come back and perform really well. There's people like that for sure. Yeah, we call that the, the North Korean model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, your family will be executed and a bill for the bullet will be mailed to you. Um, so, you know, it's like that's that's a personal pre- preference from the athletes and coaches perspective. Uh, you know, big thing is just doing the right thing and being aware of what the right thing is. You know, you, you learn it, learn the athletes, and, and you form a relationship and rapport. If I say, hey, you're fine, don't worry about it, you're okay, they need to trust that that's, that's the right answer. Uh, even though inside I might be, you know, shitting brick, <laughs> that, fuck, this is not good. Uh, uh, I, definitely, you know. I definitely remember your reaction uh, you and Damron meeting eyes after Colin missed the, <laughs> at the AO. At the yeah, AO. Colin, Colin missed a, this is a, the American open. Colin missed a 185 clean and jerk before his opener. His, yeah. His last warm up. I was sitting, I was like squatting down watching it. And right after he missed, I like rolled my eyes and turned to my right. And Nathan Damron was sitting right there and he looked at me and I looked at him. We both looked at this. It was like this, this moment where we both looked like, Oh shit. How's this going to go? Yeah. <laughs> He was anyway. probably a little more happy, and, and I was a little more nervous. But uh, Colin, you know, Colin, Colin crushed it after that. Uh, you know, same thing happened here. Uh, you know, Colin, Colin did a real shaky, shaky jerk on his last one, and then went out there and destroyed it. That's something that's interesting, actually, as, as just a, a moment for all younger coaches. People's last clean and jerk in the warm-ups, I have seen many times – that is the hardest lift of the competition because there's really basically the most anxiety because it's the heaviest weight you're taking in the back. So a lot of it rides on how is this going to feel? And then it's also the least amount of uh, excitement because you're not in front of the crowd yet. So you might see somebody take their last clean and jerk and it's, it's their last clean and jerk warm up and it's very tough and it looks rough and it's, it's hard. They go on the platform and it looks like the bar is 10 kilos lighter. Uh, you know, just, just something I've noticed many times. Um, you know, so it's like you got to be you got to be just confident and aware uh, and, and not making too many adjustments about things, especially if people miss, you know, you just just make make good choices, make the choices that you think are best and stick with them uh, and then learn and, and do it the next time better. Um, yeah. So, I mean. I think, you know, it also helps to have really good athletes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I say all this, but I mean, Nicole's a, a fantastic athlete. I mean, you know, Alyssa's an incredible athlete. Everyone there is, is a really, really solid athlete. Um, 
so it's like, you know, when I say, oh, just let them go and do it, like, <laughs> that may work for the small group of people I have that are super talented. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, going on, we're on the 94s now. Yeah. So Colin was next. Colin, uh, Colin was in really good shape here. Uh, came in with the intent of going 174, 204, and uh, went out there. Warm-ups went off without a hitch. He was a little bit rusty, a little rough-looking in the back, but it was just taking him time to kind of warm up. Uh, and then smashed 162, uh, or what I thought was a great attempt. Got two whites and a red, went in the back, sat down. At this time, there's no one even close. Damron had bombed, uh, and, you know, no one else in that category can really contend with Colin. Um and really, if Colin snatches well, no one's going to fight with him. I mean, yeah. you know, you know, no one's there. Um, so we're sitting there on 162. I go to change it. Our plan is to go 62 to 70 and then to 74 because he still needed a total, uh, you know, for the world. So we wanted to set up at least a, a decent total. Then then I get this this jury stop. Yeah, and they it, it, stopped it and took it away from him. It was it was like thirty second, like almost thirty seconds after. It was oh yeah, it was a ways in. So you know, and I, whatever. Personally, my personal opinion on red lights and whatnot is I get frustrated and angry, you know, and obviously throw pencils at at the table or whatever <laughs> I do. I get pissed because I'm angry because you know they're fucking with my team, they're fucking with my people. Uh, but from a professional standpoint, you just have to accept that. You know, you're going to get good calls and you're going to get bad calls and it's going to come out in the wash and you do the best you can. You know, I will say this, the best coaching cue you'll ever hear in your whole life are three red lights because you get that and the next thing you do, you come back on the lift, it's going to be better. So we said, you know, from a, from a strategic standpoint, it was just smarter to take 62 because you didn't really need to, to do anything silly take 62 on the next one it was it was just a joke uh you know it was an easy lift yeah smash 62 and the people in the audience definitely saw it the people on the live stream may have seen it but you know he's the grumpy cat like not the smiliest guy to begin with colin i think tried to blow up the jury with the look (laughs) that he gave them it was the death star like this eye just oh, yeah. built up the laser and just yeah. just right at the jury as he was walking off the stage after making making the sixty two. The, they definitely had a a motivated by hate yeah. <laughs> uh, he was lifter. Not, there. You know, because he and I both knew right after that jury overturn, he had we weren't going to take a shot at six uh, the record, right? Yeah. Um, which just you know that that pisses you off, you know and and he was ready because he came back on the third and we he just destroyed seventy. It was a a beautiful one seventy snatch, one of the easiest I've seen him do. Um, you know, I should have yelled at him to double it because he's been trying to <laughs> trying to double one seventy for a while, and he probably could have done it right there. Uh, anyways, you know that was that was what it was going into the clean and jerk. It was the same kind of thing, well, not the same kind of thing it was. No, no competition there. Um, I kind of knew, okay, Damron's going to probably take a shot at 200. We want to take a smart attempt to buy some time, um, you know, so that we can get other people in between our second attempt, clean and jerk, and the third one at 204. Uh, so we call 199, knowing that, you know, people are going to take 200 or someone's going to try it. Um, you know, first clean and jerk at 192 was easy. uh, 199 was really solid and then uh, took 204 the clean was very very strong which the cleans have just been improving you know for the last six months eight months yeah that that's the biggest thing for me as as a fan watching you know having watched colin now from 2014 nationals or even let's say 2014 arnold now through 2017 nationals his improved cleans improved leg strength has yes probably added years to to my life because <laughs> before it was just such a you know the emotional struggle yeah even watch him clean 93 95 like is he gonna stand it up and if he does does yeah. he have any legs left 
Now, yeah. now they're just afterthoughts. Yeah, the cleans are just routine, which they should be. You know, as a as a weightlifter who's trained well, the clean is just a utility to finish the lift. I mean, it should never be a, a concern in your mind. Um, and he, he certainly looks like that. He's a very powerful, very powerful athlete. Uh, you know, the 204, he just kind of made a little error on the jerk. And, and you know, I don't remember if he, if he shorted it or cut it, but he, he kind of caught it a little forward or left himself behind the bar. Um, you know, it probably had he taken like another couple seconds and, and just, you know, focused a little more and had, had stuck it, he would have been there. I think sometimes you kind of rush, you're a little tired, you're a little off, and so you just kind of, you don't take that extra second to, to make it perfect. Uh, and, you know, Colin is a guy who's very methodical and very meticulous, so, you know, really just a small error. He jerked 210 in training off the blocks and 205 for a double off the blocks, uh, you know, a few weeks before that, so I, I know he can make the jerk. Um, and he's done 204 in training. Uh, it's just, you know, a little error. Would you say, but, the, uh, would you say the clean... Yeah. In the clean and jerk, that's really just like the walkout in the squat now. So maybe yeah, Colin could join like some a monolift uh, weightlifting <laughs> federation. They should. They should <laughs> just get rid of the the why clean it. I mean, everybody can clean it, you know. <laughs> and you're a good guy, so here's a white light. <laughs> no matter what we're talking about, we find a way to bash multi body powerlifting. Well, I mean, that's it, what that's what the people write know, in the reviews. That's what they want. It, it just lends itself to being abused so much. Yeah. Uh, they, anyways, they're asking for it. Yeah. Uh, we also had James Townsend in the yes. in the ninety four A session. James yeah, James has been struggling for for weeks, man, really months. To be honest, with the, yeah. his elbow problems, kind of started as a bicep issue. He had torn his bicep uh, maybe a year or so ago in uh, grid, and then. You know, just just still trying to train hard on it. He's had a lot of problems with that, so hadn't been doing the training in the jerk particularly. I mean, he hadn't jerked at all um, yeah. coming into it. So, you know, he, he snatched one one for three in the snatch with thirty two two close attempts at thirty seven. Uh, yeah, and just didn't have it in his in his elbow. You know, with no warm ups, no jerk. Yeah, in yeah. the warm up room. You know that. James James is the embodiment of team player. I mean, actually, everybody on the team is really awesome. I mean, James was sitting in the audience. James's family was there. James's daughter, uh, both of them were there. Um, probably the best athlete in the entire building yes. when she was there. Uh, if you haven't but, seen uh, James's older daughter on uh, uh, his Instagram, yeah. Princess P, yeah. well, the funniest little kid ever. For, if you want to feel bad about yourself, watch just watch what she can do. Yeah, it's, three-year-old doing like twenty-five-inch box jumps, handstand push-ups, yeah. endless cartwheels and somersaults. She started walking at seven months. Yeah, and and is very intelligent too. Yes. Like really, really smart, of course. Uh, so you know that's you know. <laughs> Anyways, he was there the whole time, hurt did whatever, but he was in the, he was in the stands, you know, he didn't have to, he didn't have to be the guy who was doing that, but, uh, you know, he was, it was awesome. I mean, he, he really just came through and, and was a team player. He's always in the back supporting everybody. He's a fantastic guy. Uh, you know, I really hope that we can get the elbow sorted out and he can start training for real. Um, you know, and, and he's got, he's got some direction now. He got, saw some people there and, and they give him some ideas and, and thoughts as to what to do. Uh, so I, I really hope he, he can get that stuff squared away. Most impressive looking in the singlet for sure. He yeah. Win, he wins that, yeah. that medal, yeah. gold medal for James in, in, yeah. in the introduction portion of, of things. Oh. I will say that, that Jason Bonick dude in, who was the bronze medalist in 94 is, is super jacked. Phil is, is super jacked. Phil doesn't have the tan part down quite like Bonnick and James do. Yeah. Uh, so Colin at in weightlifting years at 34 was the youngest guy on the podium. Yeah. Phil Colin 34, Phil 35, Bonnick 36. Yeah. And the 94s. 94 that's, kilo masters of disaster. Yeah. yeah. Grind Sports Nutrition is the official supplement provider of Team Juggernaut. Designed by Renaissance Periodization, there are no-nonsense supplements to fuel your hardest training. Use Jug10 at grindsupplements.com. 
So then moving on to Sunday, our, fi- our final day uh, of the competition, we had the two lifters. 75 yeah. kilo class was uh, Kiana Welch. And then in the 90s, we had Laura Barato. So yeah. uh, this was Q, only Q's third weightlifting meet ever. Um, you know, last September, October, she did qualifier up at Max's gym and then yeah. went on to become the first champion anywhere in the world in the 90 kilo class by winning the American Open. Yes. Uh, first woman to win a 90 kilo competition on the planet. Uh, she, Q has been another, Q is another super, super talented athlete. Uh, you know, Q's struggled kind of up and down a little bit with knee, uh, knee and shoulder stuff. Her shoulder was doing some Frankenstein shit (laughs) for a while there. It was just weird as hell, but, uh, doing awesome coming around now. Uh, she did fantastic in the snatch, made a PR, a competition PR 102, Three for three. Uh, three for three was great. Made her first two clean and jerks, 108 and 112. And uh, we called for 117, trying to trying to push everybody. If she'd have made 17, that would have been a 219 total, which would have gotten silver, I believe. Because yeah. I think Stallings did 103 and 120. And uh, Shakesha Johnson did 102. One, or yeah, one hundred one and one uh, six. I think she. I, I think she ended up only jerking maybe one sixteen or seventeen. And yeah, so it, it was the right number. I think uh, cleaned it really well, and then you know just a little bit of an error on the jerk uh, pushed herself back from it a little bit. She doesn't have a ton of experience with split jerks, um, but she's gotten way better. Uh, you know, she had to power jerk at the American Open. It was still and- a question. In my, in my head, in your head, I think in Q's own head. Of Would what, you have to ask me? What, what was it? She says to me in the warm-ups, maybe, or maybe the training hall, she says, yeah. so if we get into that 120 range, is it okay if I just pick various jerks, whatever, <laughs> I, whatever feels right? <laughs> and I was like, no, we're going to do a split jerk. You got to do it. You got to do that. Uh, so maybe I should have let her do whatever. I should have said, just just make it. And who knows what she would have done. Uh, <laughs> that would have been very interesting. You see that there was a video going going around this, this week of a guy who did he did a split jerk. And then as he went to recover, he kind of lost it in the recovery, but kept it locked out and and went into a squat jerk from the split jerk. Uh, was he a, a Asian lifter? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's an old video. He like stepped oh, okay. like... 10 feet forward on the platform. Uh, maybe a different video. Uh, there was this guy maybe a few years ago, 20, early, maybe 2012, 2013. This guy does a, does a split jerk, stumbles forward, steps down into a squat, maybe takes a couple of steps and then stands back up. That was incredible. Yeah. He made the S- lift. S- similar kind of situation. This yeah. guy didn't move too much, but... Yeah. Uh, Maybe that's maybe that's going to be Q's signature. The, oh my God. the split that will not be a low anxiety situation for the, me. If the, that split, <laughs> the split squat jerk, the splat jerk. <laughs> squat, yeah. I, I once heard Kendrick said that he didn't know what he was going to do until he started to jerk. He had no idea. He just would go, and his body would just do whatever. Yeah. So that's a bold strategy. It worked, it worked for him to some degree. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, she, she ended up getting bronze total silver snatch and I want to say fourth or fifth in the clean and jerk. Fifth in the clean and jerk, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, really good meet for her. Uh, I think that gives her an opportunity to, uh, improve maybe a stipend, uh, and, and just in general, a great, you know, a great experience for your third meet, you know, really, really good. Um, so very cool for her. I'm really happy with Q. She's going to keep getting better. It's also good to have a meet like that for someone like Q because it reinforces, uh, you know, it's some reward, but not so much that you're just victorious. And it seems like, you know, it's, it would have been great if everything worked out and you got really good. But when there's a little bit of struggle that the, what do we talk about? The near miss, right? Yeah. The, yeah. the, the, that near miss is really good because it motivates you, you know, in communicating with her since then, she's been highly motivated, you know, and, and wants to push forward and do that. So 
that's a really good situation for her. I'm, I'm excited to see what she does in the future. Um, I'm sure she can add many kilos to that total. Yeah. Then the, uh, the, and, the women's team was rounded out by our 90 kilo class yeah. lifter, who was a 75 kilo class lifter at the AO, and her and Q traded. Uh, Laura Barito, who's a longtime athlete under Colin Burns, um, yeah. originally in person in Louisville, Kentucky, and now a, a remote athlete, and she she handled herself very well. Three for three in the snatch. Uh, I, I think at least two of those lifts were were PRs, I think. Yeah. And then uh, uh, she finished 92 in the snatch. And then in the clean and jerk, you know, at, at this point, from a team standpoint, uh, we went into this thinking, all right, as long as Laura totals, we're going to yeah. win. We're, we're winning the team title for the women's, and we'll get into that in the, in a bit. But, uh, yeah. but Colin made us sweat a little bit with some of those those <laughs> jerk, the, the opening jerk kept bumping up, bumping up. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, but she did that uh, lifetime PR total, I believe. I think she made two hundred one, um, two hundred one total. So big competition total PR. Obviously, a new weight class, like twelve kilos higher than she ever did at seventy five, and I think one kilo better in the total than she ever did in training. So yeah, it was great, great meet for Laura. You know, cool to see Colin doing his thing as the coach there, having a successful athlete. Yeah. Yeah. That was cool. Uh, she's improved a lot. She's a good athlete. Another really good athlete, like good competitor comes out, makes lifts, makes attempts, uh, you know, and is, is really highly focused too. You can see when Laura is kind of around, she's very serious. Um, and just, you know, put, puts a lot into being a good competitor and, and really, I think, uh, you know, I don't really know Laura super well, but uh, she strikes me as kind of like Colin and maybe a lot of that comes from Colin, but just meticulous and methodical about how she approaches the different aspects of lifting and the actual competition itself. So that was cool. Uh, certainly for us, it was exciting yeah. to watch her that clean and jerk and feel like, you know, we added the points up, uh, probably premature, but apparently, <laughs> Apparently, there's a there's another team that we did not realize was a team. Yeah, uh, not realize what was going on, but uh, yeah, I so guess with, with the Florida LWC from time to time when they're when they're feeling the need to show up with a humongous team that <laughs> didn't exist before the meet. Uh, they combine forces and form a super team. Well, not really a super team, just a really big team that loads up the classes that score tons of points. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and what that, was the, that was, that was my, my frustration in it. You know, we, 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 of course, we, we want to help all the, the individual lifters be as, as good as they can. But we want to win the team stuff. We won the the women's team championship at the American Open. We were looking to do that at nationals as well. Yeah, I've, I kind of got on on paper the different teams who I see as being being the real competition to us based on what I'd seen at American Open and based on you know just looking at the lists and looking at the the names. So yeah. I'm figuring, all right, it's us. It's Catalyst, Cal Strength, Mash, and uh, that 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 was our big competition. You know, and on Florida Elite, I see Maddie Rogers, I see Taylor Stallings, which apparently the announcer was saying her name right, and we'd yeah, we'd, Taylor, yeah, Talar, and we'd been saying oh, yeah. her name Directed wrong the whole time. Um, and I was like, okay, they're going to score the points, but I didn't really know the, the other names. And it's and yeah, so what what Florida Elite did in constructing their team, that's whatever. It was it was it was the rules. My sure. my greater frustration, I guess, is is the way the scoring is set up. It just doesn't seem like it. It's yeah, evenly rewarding. You know, it's it's not rewarding the best possible lifting, and and this will it'll always be true to some degree. Um, so the the way that the scoring works is the same way it works at IWF uh, World Championships, which is. First through twenty fifth score points. Twenty eight points for first, one point for twenty fifth, 
and kind of just scaled throughout that, which at Worlds, yeah, there's not 25 people in every weight class at Worlds, but it's highly, highly competitive. And, yeah. you know, we have American record holding lifters who are, are sometimes in a C or D session at yeah. Worlds. So there's, there's very, very competitive lifting where at, at Nationals, you get weight classes that only have eight people in them, something like that. And there's just massive spread between first and, and eighth. And, you know, maybe maybe I'm just whining about it, and I, I guess it was the yeah. the rules that were yeah. presented. But if you want to just win a team championship, get some get 248s, get 290 pluses, you know, yeah. 153, 1, 190, and a 75, I guess, and, and that's going to win you the most points. Because we've got yeah. Kristen Pope within 8 kilos of first place in the 63s getting 8th place, which is 18 points. And then we have the 90 plus women eighth place finisher out of eight. Yeah. 60, 70 kilos behind Sarah Robles total also getting eighth place and scoring 18 points. So it was a, uh, an unpleasant surprise to find out that we had in fact not won the uh, women's team championship, but you know, if you looked at, if you looked at the Sinclair, formula of all those positions or if you looked at them relative to what the top did right uh you end up in a situation where okay lower i mean lower the heavier the weight classes get you're always going to have lower qualified athletes in those classes placing higher because of the nature of training you know the bigger you are the longer it takes to develop to get to those levels um so so you know 90 kilo girl Maybe that's her second meet. I mean, look at Q, right? That's her Q's third meet, and she's placing that high in 75s. The 90s has got to be even more diluted, um, you know, to where I guess they just pull the mirror under your nose, and if it fogs up, you're you're qualified. <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it's not. I'm not trying to take anything away from a 90 kilo girl. Uh, I'm just saying it's definitely lower qualified athletes are going to place higher. They're going to be there. There's just how many people were there? Eight. There's eight people in that session. Yeah. I mean, and it's it's not to take anything away from from the lifter or their effort yeah. either. You know, yeah, I mean, we're making jokes about it, but the, but the my frustration with it is 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 because of the the depth of talent or and lack of depth of talent in some of these, you have very exceptional lifters, of which we have many. We had yeah. had two men's champions and a women's champion. The only team, or we had the most, the only team with multiple men's champions. The only team with both men's and women's champions, uh, you know, first, second, and third place women, and I don't know. I, I guess I'm, I, I guess we're just whining about it at the end of the day. But I would like to see the scoring changed to the way that track scoring is done, um, which is is more top heavy. Uh, which yeah. would be scoring the first eight places, ten for first, seven or. 10, 8, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And yes, it would have still meant that the 8th place, last place finisher in 90 plus and Pope would have still scored the same, one point each, but one point each is much different than 18 points each because it's 10% of the top point score rather than 60%, 18 compared to 28, rather rather than than 1 compared to 10. So I think that that would be a, a better system to it, I think it would be in the better interest of USAW to do that for several reasons. One, the way that we're going to get Olympic medals and international medals is by having the best lifters. You know, yeah, it, it's 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 a mix of, fo- of focusing on on yes, growing the sport in whole to bring more potential talent in, and you know, having more members and all that kind of stuff, but doing that without sacrificing, pushing the top lifters higher and higher because they are the ones who are going to, are going to one day potentially, you know, win these, win these medals. So it's, it's the striking the balance of that, but also within the team structure, you know, and I think it is imp- the, the team competition is important um, because it's, it is largely on, especially with the, the downfall of the OTC, largely on the privatized teams. Yes. You know, we are one of those most prominent ones, but you know, Juggernaut, Mash, Catalyst, Cal Strength, um, 
those teams to 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 build their brand to to be able to yeah. better support lifters to be able to 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 better develop these lifters who can be potential uh, international medalists and I think a more reward to the top end of performance would would better aid that it would better incentivize that I, I also think that it doesn't make sense there, you know there, it makes no sense to use the world championship scoring because uh you know we just the the classes are so unbalanced here i mean and even internationally they're a little bit off uh the we used to have a national scoring system that was top 10 and it may have been the track and field one and they they moved away from that a few years ago um you know it it lends itself to bigger teams rather than better teams. Um, you know, if you have, or, or really not even better, just, or not bigger, sorry, but uh, filling the classes that are light on competition yeah. uh, versus, you know, having all of your lifters packed into the most competitive sessions. I mean, we had Alyssa was in one of the most competitive, Courtney Bachelor, another competitive one, 63s were super competitive, uh, 94s were competitive. Uh, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of like it's not like you know you have a team full of supers and 90s and 75s i mean six girls in there all doing the same total would probably rank uh as one of the best teams right yeah. and then yeah so it's it's off it is uh you know well, I guess kind that, of a whatever that's, that's the reality of it i i do i do think though that that changing the scoring to to be more rewarding to very high placing yeah, would incentivize teams because the teams care. The teams care about the team finish. You know? They do, yeah. And yeah. It, it's going to incentivize them to to develop better lifters rather than a more wide breadth of of lifters across weight classes. Where you know, because you, you could win the team championship with with eight scores, kind of all you know eighth to twelfth place type yes. of things, but which I don't think is in the yeah, and it's certainly worthy of a debate, but I don't think that's what's in the best interest of, of USAW. All the, yeah. all the lifters are important. All of them that that qualified, congratulations, that's that's great. But to to win international medals, which is is the goal, is the mission statement of of USAW. Uh, the the reward needs to be given towards the production of the highest level athletes. Yeah. So so that that was probably one of one of our few complaints about this, and I expressed that it to, to Phil quite. <laughs> Trifecta provides pre-cooked organic food delivered right to your door weekly to help fit with your Renaissance diet, fuel your hard training, improve your recovery, and make your life easier. Visit trifectanutrition.com slash juggernaut. The other, the other frustrating thing and, and probably important teachable moment of it is about, about making lifts. Um, I, yeah. I think on the men's or the women's side overall, it was about 57% makes. And on the men's side, it was like 40, 41, 42% made lifts. And, you know, we, we were not absolved from this. We had, uh, had three bomb outs, uh, you know, one kind of injury related, but, uh, and, but on the other side of that also had some five for sixes and, and uh, you know some four for sixes and five for sixes, but on on average, I think the the women were going about three point three out of six, uh, and this is the meat as a whole. While the men were were more like two point seven or something yeah. out of out of six. So so Max, as a, as a coach, what what can people do to make more lifts? Uh, you know, the big thing is is to evaluate where the miss, why the misses are happening. Are are we, you know, in some cases misses are happening at weights that they just should not happen at, uh, and that that would really essentially be weights that you lifters are making on a regular basis. You know, if your best snatch is 103 kilos, and you do that once in your whole life, then missing 102 or 103 or 104 is it's not acceptable as much as it is it's, you know, your probability of making that was low to begin with because it's such a high weight. But if your best snatch is a hundred kilos and you're missing 96 or 93, 
that's, you know, it's less acceptable by far because you should be making that lift. And if you're making it, you know, once every week or every couple of weeks when you go heavy, then there's no reason why you shouldn't be successful there. So, you know, evaluating that is, is big to see why the misses are happening. And then the other thing is, you know, refining technique, but also refining uh, the competitive uh, mindset. I think that a lot of people on our team were, you know, I think a lot of our misses were coming out of, uh, you know, I don't want to point anyone out or single anyone out because everyone is making and missing lifts. No one, no one went six for six. Uh, you know, there's, there's misses, misses that are coming. You know, there's a lot of things you can do to, to mitigate the chances of missing. One of them is be methodical about everything you do. Create a routine in your habits and your lifting every rep, every day, you know, uh, never rush through anything. Never think that doing something different than what you've practiced will be successful. Uh, so that's a big one is, is just really locking down and tightening down the perfecting of the movements. Whether right. your technique is good or bad is not relevant as much as your technique is extremely consistent, right? Uh, and not letting, you know, not, not letting panic, not letting anxiety change what you do and how you attempt it and how you approach the lift. You know, the way you clean and jerk 50 kilos should look the same way you clean and jerk 150 or 200. Uh, your mental approach, all those things the same. Uh, and that's not to say go, you know, crazy and ape shit, but it's to be, you know, follow the exact same steps. You know, if you bought, if you pop your left hand out first on 50, you pop your left hand out first on every other weight every single time. That's the first step. The second step I think is in selecting weights and, and establishing in your head what, what you're capable of and picking really good attempts. Uh, you know, if you're missing those attempts, it either wasn't the right attempt or you made a mistake. If you're already doing this to the first step and you're doing everything you can to have good technique and be consistent, the next thing is picking the right attempts. Uh, you know, and, and if you're picking the right attempts that are doable and they have good technique, then it's a, it's a mental issue of, of, you know, either the lifter isn't believing they're capable and they let doubt creep in, which changes things, or the lifter is not, uh, committed to making the lift. You know, they, they maybe don't, they aren't putting in the, you know, they don't, they don't have the edge, I guess you could say that sort of factor of like, you know. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to make sure this lift is without a doubt. Excellent. You know, the, the Colin scenario is good. The 162 we did in the first one was, was good, but you know, eh, it wasn't good enough. So the second 62 was that much better. The seven, the second 62 was with an absoluteness to it that, that solidified it being perfect. Um, and I think that's the kind of approach you got to you got to take is is every lift is going to be like that. And if people aren't putting in that effort or showing that, then you got to establish a reason for them to. And in regards to selecting attempts, do you have any advice? You know, as far as picking an opener, because that I mean, if if you don't make your opener, that's step one to to a bomb out. So if you yeah. make if you make yeah. your opener, you're really reduced your chances of bombing out at that point. The uh, only thing. We're- and missing your opener is missing your second. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. So, I mean, you know, in terms of making an opener, picking an opener, you should be – the that all starts in the training cycle. You know, your consistency with weights is a big thing. You know, we do a lot of, like, time singles workouts and just workouts with lots of repetitions in them because it gives us a good a good perspective on how lifters lift. If you're doing – 10 to 15 singles and you're you're missing half of them even if you snatch 100 kilos if you're missing half your lifts between 80 and 100 you know there's no number in there that we could you know safely say yeah he's going to be good at 90 as an opener or or or, you know we got to look at what it is if you're doing 15 20 singles in a workout and you hit 85 90 percent of them every time and you only start to miss when you're within five kilos of your best then we know how stable you are and where you're gonna where you're gonna start. So in the training process, there has to be some kind of way for us to gauge what your abilities are, where you're consistent, you know, what you can actually do. Uh, then in the meet, picking openers is you know depending on who you are, it's it's really easy to it's really easy to to not bomb out. You know, bombing in more than a you know 
it's really easy to not bomb out. Just pick attempts that are really, really easy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that's what's so hard about that. I mean, if you bomb out of one or two meets in a row, it's easy. You just stop bombing by opening lighter and being successful and building on that. It's tough when you're fighting and you're trying to score a lot of points or you have to open a certain weight or you're pushing really hard because then you're picking numbers that are probably outside of that zone of, of 100%, right? So, I mean, there's people out there that believe that have fucking formulas and numbers and percentages that you got to open at this or take a weight, what's your best triple or do this. I mean, a lot of it is coaching experience, you know, learn the athlete, learn the lifter, make a, a judgment call as to what you think is going to be right. Something we did in that, in that podcast with Cohen that I thought was really great was his, he was describing his formula for creating his training cycle. And he said he'd just write it out over and over and over again until he found that what he looked at looked right. You know, and, and I believe as a coach, that's a big part of, of selecting openers for people is just, just look at it over and over and over again until it looks like that's the right number. Uh, you know, and, and be smart about it and make sense of it, right? You know, hey, if we take this, we'll be here. If we take this, that, you can do this, you know I mean? And then pick numbers you should make. Yeah, and uh, to, to me, the, there's definitely overlap with the, the peaking process for powerlifting yeah. with attempt selection and, and, and competing for weightlifting. The, the things, you know, taken away from or taken from what you're talking about, too, that we can really distill it down to for people. Like, is one, you got to control what you can control. Don't worry about what you can't. That's from a training standpoint and at the competition, you know, be methodical about your technique, be precise, have your, your process to approaching the lift, you know, hand placement, foot placement, every, everything that you do that you, that's within your control and repeatable. Cause when you get to the meet, when you're at nationals and it's a shit show in the back room, you know, s- stuff isn't going to be just the way that you like it at, at your own gym or you train in your garage or whatever. And you get to put your song on and, and everyone stops to watch you. No, they don't give a shit. They ain't stopping. You know, there's people walking in front of you, all that stuff. So, you know, take control of the stuff that you can and put aside what you can't. I think this yeah. one, this one for powerlifting and weightlifting, but maybe even more so for, for weightlifting is, is you got to create the pressure situations. You got to practice the pressure yeah. because, yeah. you know, having all the time in the world to go, to, to set up and, and, and set everything up just the way you want for yourself in training makes it a lot easier to make that lift than, okay, you're up, you have one minute, you know, or, or we're, we're jockeying around attempts and, and the amount of time you have is, is changing more or less, whatever it is. And now you got to go out and go, you know, if, if our lifters here weren't doing those on the minute on the, that on the minute work and, and that little bit more pressure situation stuff, well, the, then maybe Kristen Pope's not running from the from the platform from the back warm up platform onto the platform to make a clean and jerk. You know, practice yeah. the pressure situation uh, because competing is a skill, just like like technique is. It has to be practiced. So so create those pressure situations for yourself, whether it's time, whether it's environment, all yeah. that stuff. Practice it. Um, you know, yeah. And yeah. I think be realistic with yourself. You know, something we failed to do with Sam Ernst or Sam failed to do. With with us, you know, if you're training four kilos over, over your over body weight, the numbers got to be adjusted, you know. Yeah. And, and this isn't you know to criticize Sam. He's going to be a very good lifter. He's he's only what 19 years old. Yeah, he's yeah, and uh, yeah, he's he's going to be very good. But and he's certainly not the only person to to have made this mistake ever, or or we're not as as coaches. But you know, be be realistic. Don't think that. Oh yeah, even though I've been I've been four kilos over my body weight, I'll, I'll go. It'll be fine. You know, I, I handle I handle the weight cut. I, I I bounce back from a weight cut well. I bounce back from a weight cut well are probably some fucking famous last words yep. of, of the lifter because you don't. You probably the odds are you probably don't. Yeah. And yeah. so so be realistic in in making those adjustments and and you got to always you know take what the day gives you. To, to build your total, to make lifts. You know, if, if we, I don't have the, the data in front of me, but I'm sure if we were to look at the medalists, you're going to see a lot of four for sixes, a lot of five for yeah. sixes, and a couple six for sixes. Yeah. Very hard to have a successful day without having successful lifts 
to go along with it. Yeah. You know? it, it, yeah. I mean that, you know, that's, that's the, I don't remember. I want to say your yeah, Q's Q on a session was really good because I know that Taylor, Taylor made five lifts. No, oh, and I know that four, four lifts, three, three snatches and, no, she only made three or four lifts. No, but didn't she make two cleaning jerks? I I think she opened at she opened at one twenty. Or she missed it on the press out. She made I think she made sixteen, then twenty. She pressed it out the first time oh, okay. and then made it at twenty. And I think she made two two or three snatches. Two snatches. Two snatches. Well in, in her case example of there's a four for six that wins it, but she's also kinda head and shoulders above other people in her abilities. Yes. So you're going to see, I mean, kind of is an understatement, but uh, you're going to see a lot more people like that where they might miss or make a few lifts here and there and, and win it, uh, or if the competition is really kind of soft. But even so, uh, four, four for six for her, five for six for Q, four for right. six, which should have been five for six you know, for Colin, or should have been right. four for five, I guess, uh, taking away the, the jury overturn. Um, Alyssa, five for six. Mike Fox. Alyssa's, Alyssa's a great example where Alyssa's five for six was, I mean, that was against other five for sixes. Yeah. And that was just, that's just, nobody was winning that with two lifts. Yeah. Uh, you so, know. So you can come into the meet with all the, the goals and everything that you want. But then when, you know, in, in the words of Mike Tyson, like when you get, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Well, everyone yeah. has, everyone has the numbers they want to take until they miss a warm up. You know, until, until they get something overturned and then you, yeah. then you adjust and then, then you try and lift the most weight you can that day, yes, exactly. not the most weight yes. you hope that you can lift, that you wish that you could lift, that you yeah. told your, your 17 Instagram followers that you were going to lift <laughs> and then, and then you you know, were, whatever, like, you gotta take, take what the day gives you is, is it's a sport. You know, it's like going in thinking you're going to be, you know, I did 185 one time in the gym. I'm going to go in and try 190 or I got to leave. You know, it's like go in, go in to make the list you need to win. I guarantee you most of the people on the international podium are not taking PR attempts for win. And when they do, it's a Hail Mary Steiner situation where the guy goes out there for eight kilo, 10 kilo PR for a gold medal to win. And, it, you know, it's. It's a heroic story. Yeah, a lot of them uh, are taking lifts that they've done fifteen times in training because it's all about being successful. And even more so now, the rules changing without the body weight class. It's all about being able to make three consecutive lifts with a very very tight grouping. Uh, and so that's a huge a huge part of the of the sport is getting your ego out of your head, getting getting all those things out of your mind, and just successful attempts will produce big results. Yeah, you don't, you don't think that Colin wanted to take. 200 rather than 199 yeah. but you know 199 <laughs> is is the number that that's working and and he obviously yeah. he could have made 200 but it was it was all part of the the strategy it was all part of taking what the day gives it yep. so yep. you know overall fantastic uh weekend by team juggernaut lifters by coach max by joanne yep. uh by usaw all the volunteers very thankful for for all the hard work there you know Cool to see the national meets continue to grow, both in production, in quality of lifting. Uh, you know, very very competitive weight classes, lots of very competitive weight classes. Uh, put together a strong Pan Am team for the U.S. and yep. you know, just a, a lot of positive things to to build on. And and you know, once they change the team scoring system to the way that I said, then they'll really be onto something. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yep. what what do you got coming up, Max? Uh, I got a seminar coming up in June third and fourth uh, in uh, College Station, so that's going to be good at Braz, Brazos Valley Barbell. Mm-hmm. Almost misspoke there. Uh, and then I have another one in North Carolina. Uh, I can't remember the date on that J- one. July eighth. Uh, July eighth. Life. Yeah. Uh, and uh, interesting, I'll actually be doing a seminar, just a very short squat seminar at Facebook headquarters. Well, then. 
coming up in the next few weeks somewhere. You think, or, you think we're Zucker- trying to organize it right now. Me Z- and Zuckerberg are going back and forth on it. I, oh, Zuck. He's a staunch supporter of the Ripito Lomar squad. <laughs> he I'm would be. He would be. Zuckerberg's, Zuckerberg's probably net beard and all, neck beard and all over Reddit about, oh, about starting strength. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I have no seminars that people can actually sign up for because Austin is sold out. But uh, if you are in the Austin area on June 3rd, Marissa and I will be at the Naturally Fit Games. So come and check that out for sure. Um, beyond that, we'll just be gallivanting across Europe for the IPF Raw Worlds. Um, online coaching. We've got it. You need it and we've got it. Uh, weight, weightlifting, powerlifting, masters weightlifting, because we didn't really uh, get to address it here, but Max uh, was was away in New Zealand and just crushing the masters weightlifting world, led by the master of disaster, Joanne Ada, who was, yep. maybe we'll have a bigger discussion on part of this in another episode, but uh, the the best weightlifter the best weightlifter there and then never had a penis category. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but he had five, five lifters there. Yes. Five lifters, four total medalists. Uh, so for the master stuff, if you're looking for good master's coaching, the guy in the computer is, is the man on that. And then our newly launched super total coaching. So weightlifting plus powerlifting all mashed up into one, so go check that out at juggernautcoaching.com. Beyond that, he's Max Ada, at Max underscore Ada on Instagram, Max Ada on Facebook. I'm Chad Wesley Smith, at Chad Wesley Smith, and at Juggernaut Training. Facebook and Instagram, filling up your news feed all day. If you like the podcast, please uh, give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Uh, write us a funny review. We love seeing the funny reviews. We love getting the good ratings and eking up those iTunes charts, and uh, and your support really helps us out. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, best fitness YouTube content there is. And uh, otherwise, I guess we'll just see you next week. All right. All right. Out, guys.